again. Sorry, there are some technical issues. We, we're actually now in the wrong room. Um, I sent you the new link here. Yes, we have to use the afternoon uh, session room. So that was a bit, uh, we have to switch over. Uh, no, it's in the in the chat, in the private chat. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. So, sorry for for all the technical inconvenience and, and issues. No. Um, now we're um, ready to continue with the second talk today. Um, uh, the th third talk today, sorry. Ken Golding is uh, presenting about leaflet, right? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm a bit... Uh, Oh. Zara, Zara. Z Zara. Just a second. I have to get in here back. Um, it's a bit, bit further and back because we're now using actually the afternoon session room and that sort of uh, caused quite a bit of, uh, of trouble and uh, the delay. So... Okay, the Zaru platform for real-time spatial dashboards, and that spatial dashboard uh, topic has been quite uh, quite of interest, um, especially during the pandemic. So um, I'm very keen to hear what you uh, have to present here, Ken, and uh, the floor is yours. So if you have a presentation to share. Uh, Great, I'll go ahead and share that. We'll add it to the stream. Okay, just one second. All right, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. And just to double check, if I switch to here, the examples, you can see that too? Yes, I can see that too. Um, well, now I see that we're actually ahead schedule because the earlier presentation was uh, relatively short. Um, yeah, I believe we're scheduled to start at uh, 10 Eastern. Um, so I don't know if we, um, I can certainly start now or we can start then. I think it's better if we, because there, if there are people switching from room to room, yeah, uh, we can, uh, we can wait for them. Okay. No worries. So, and just to be um, clear, it's, it's be 20 minute presentation, 10 minute Q and A, right? Yes. Excellent. So maybe just to fill the fill the void, maybe uh, you can tell a little bit about sort of what is your background of uh, working with that topic. What sort of your motivation behind it, and from what? Sure, I'll get into that you... a little bit in the, in the in the presentation. But yeah, um, just while folks are kind of filtering in. Um, so uh, yeah, we've developed this at at Sasaki. Um, so we're a, a multidisciplinary uh, design. For, firm uh, headquartered in um, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, we, you know, we use geospatial for a, a number of different things. Um, but it's, it's, there's kind of a mix of, uh, you know, uh, profession, professional designers um, who need to kind of be discovering this information. Um, as well as, um, you know, we have, we have a few kind of uh, GIS experts. But what we found is that, you know, we often need answers. Um, at, at, to kind of um, be available very quickly. And so um, I've started to develop some of our, our own tools to, to kind of um, help with that. Um, so one example I'll, I'll mention that um, I'm actually not gonna show in, in this, this presentation, but it's, it's um, a tool that, you know, just allows people to kind of um, use a, another really nice open 
a source tool developed by Conveil called R5, which lets you just understand um, you know, who, who can reach what. Um, and then we're looking to co combine that um, with data sets on, you know, on uh, whether it's the, in the US, the loads data set, which tells you where all the workers are, or the census data, which tells you all, all the people are, and kind of understanding how a design can influence and impact different people. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, there, um, hopefully folks will in, in, enjoy the presentation. We'll have a lot of examples of some of the kind of challenges we, we found in the in current geospatial and then um, also um, some what we think of like fairly interesting solutions. Um, and also, you know, coming at this from, from a design firm perspective, we don't have huge resources to throw at this um, on the software front. Um, and so we, we're really hoping that the kind of open source geospatial community can really pick up some of these ideas and run with them potentially, if, if they're good ideas. I mean, that's one of the tests, right? To kind of put them out there and see if, if, if there's any, any traction. So that's where we're coming at this from. Um, yes, good, thank you. Um, thank you. Then I would just say now it's uh, we're a bit early still. Yeah, um, I'm happy to, uh, to wait until 10. Okay, unfortunately, it's not uh, possible to see how many people are there in the in the audience and waiting for okay. your presentation to start. Um, so nothing to, to see there. Um, but I think it's now one minute two or almost uh, 10. And I think we just start and uh, well, that's just, you mentioned that's a 20 minutes presentation and then Q and A. Mm -hmm. So the floor is yours. Perfect. Well, thanks, Stefan, um, and thanks everyone who's who's joined for the session um, and also to Fast4G for, uh, for providing this platform. Uh, we really appreciate um, that what all that Fast4G for does to kind of promote uh, sharing of ideas and solutions in open source geospatial. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be presenting on Zaru, and Zaru is a, a, an approach that grew out of the the needs of a, of a design firm. So uh, Sasaki is a multidisciplinary um, design firm with with global reach, um, and you know we really use geospatial to kind of understand our, our design context in terms of like natural man-made systems, um, access and reach, really who who can get to what and how. Um, and then also development forces like market forces and that kind of thing. And then how that relates to design strategy and making sure that the strategy is either in line with those, those forces or kind of um, it's kind of strategically um, kind of guiding some of those forces. Um, and then also, you know, we uh, spend a lot of time communicating um, our, our ideas um, as well as kind of exploring and, 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 and uncovering uh, patterns in, in data. So um, you know, we do a lot of data exploration and, and storytelling. Um, but you know, uh, in coming up with, with, with some of these solutions, uh, we felt that um, they could definitely have a reach um, beyond just what a, a design firm uh, might need. And that some of these may, may be generalizable to the broader um, geospatial community. So thanks again for, for having this, this platform to kind of talk about this. Um, so from our perspective, you know, in spite of so much great work in, in open source, we feel that, you know, um, geospatial is still dominated by by major players, and many of whom actually re repackage public data um, to make it easier to access. And this is because it's currently really hard to access through kind of a wide variety of of, of kind of tools and, and platforms. Um, and also, I think we're not keeping up with um, the kind of quantity of data that's coming in through through big data. Um, and so, you know, we uh, definitely found that source file downloads can be huge and difficult to work with. And there's few practical solutions at all for actual big data. We're talking about terabytes or petabytes of, of data. Um, and then, you know, we often find that we're kind of dealing with um, a site that is across multiple scenes and there's different, um, you know, a lot of different sources and we have a bunch of different things. So that dis discontinuous data can be hard to work with. And then one thing we we you know we see a lot is that a lot of work is repeated. Um, uh, you know, GS practitioners are, are working through the same interim stages. Like you imagine, you've got like highways or something. Everyone's doing the same buffers around the highways, um, but uh, there's no way to kind of share the the kind of interim products, which could actually be very valuable. Um, and then we feel like there's this big gap between simple tools. Um, 
that can give you very basic answers and then like super sophisticated tools that require a lot of time and, and dedicated effort and a lot of expertise. Um, and so we find it's hard for non-experts to really do anything sophisticated or discover new insights. Um, and then, yeah, why are we excited about this, uh, this approach um, is that the scale is practically limited. Um, we'll uh, kind of sh show how that play plays out. It's hard to believe in, 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 in some ways, um, but uh, there's the magic of, of slipping maps that we're able to leverage for that. Um, this is very cheap to run. There's no fancy servers. All the GPU stuff is happening on the, on the client side, not the server side, uh, which just means that uh, the infrastructure is very, uh, very easy to set up. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're really leveraging gaming techniques um, and WebGL graphics uh, for real-time exploration. We find it's incredible to be able to uh, work with these things very smoothly um, to test ideas. And then there's the seamless scale transition uh, from like global level to detailed level. Uh, without needing to switch to a new level up the hierarchy, like you know, often you would see maps which kind of show you a city, then you can zoom up to the county, then the state, and the whole country. Um, but in this case, everything can just be presented at at the most detailed level. Um, and a solution that helps with that is what we're calling this kind of uh, dynamic dot density, and then also this kind of pixel perfect uh, mixing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the other, other kind of uh, cool innovation is is a solution that lets us actually query um, millions of, of, of records, like record level data, uh, in real time and be able to filter it. So, um, as I was saying, you know, uh, Zora already takes advantage of, of Slippy Maps. I'm sure everyone's kind of familiar with with, with Slippy Maps. Um, very very widely used on on the web. But the main thing I kind of want folks to kind of be aware of is that. Each time you zoom into a slippy map, what it's doing is basically taking a tile, dividing that into four tiles. Take, and if you zoom in again, it takes that tile, divides it into four tiles. And that's happening at a tile level, and it's also happening for each individual pixel in the slippy map. And so the first examples that I'm, I'm just going to show here are kind of um, looking at that kind of unlimited scale. So you can you know, be working uh, with, with a data set here. This is a data set generated by. Um, by Mapsen, and there's actually, uh, you know, it's it's a actual big data set. There's 70 trillion uh, data points here that they've generated, and at the global kind of scale, we are able to just kind of, you know, tease out if this was like serious serial serious sea level rise. Um, you know, that's what the world would look like. So, you know, I'm calling this Earth Dunk. It's kind of just a, a very simple um, example of kind of being able to tease out some things, um, and just kind of one cool thing I noticed there is that, you know. Um, off the coast of Lima here, you have both, you have one of the deepest points on Earth. Um, if you were to then kind of change that scale, you have some of the highest points on Earth. So, you know, that incredible elevation change. Um, but this tool itself was just kind of a, a test to make sure, you know, kind of understanding how we could be applying that scale. Uh, we can then um, take that a little bit further, and this is using the, the same exact data set. Um, I can start looking at a little bit of heel shading, and this is, um, you know, just again, just loading data tiles, and then being able to play with some of the um, the metrics there. And so, for example, here um, I'm just adding um, you know, color a color ramp into well, like kind of varying that color ramp, um, you know, like a little animation feature, for example. So this is all just kind of testing the real time nature of this dashboard, and really being able to see how you know how we could be doing this rendering. And so, what's happening under the hood there? Um, is that we are just grabbing tiles, and these are coming directly from um, an S3 server where these tiles are, are being freely served. Um, and all we have is in the one one tile we have elevation data, and the other tile we actually have aspect, which is essentially um, the same as a normal when it's applied um, in kind of gaming terminology. And when we take those two things, we're then able to combine that uh, through Zaru with um, some settings, as you saw us playing with there for, for colors and that kind of thing. Um, and that gives us the, the final tile. But this is happening um, for each tile is essentially, um, in HTML terms, a canvas that's being rendered um, using reg Regal, which is a, a great little um, library for, for kind of low-level low shader-based uh, rendering. And so that's how we're able to get the speed. Um, so the tiles being loaded and then rendered all in real time based on those changes. Obviously, the source data doesn't change, but as I change those settings, I'm getting different outputs. 
Um, so another uh, solution that we're um, trying to uh, solve for is, is um, you know, when we work with um, vector graphics, and you know, um, I'm a big fan of, of Mapbox as an example of a Mapbox map, um, and they are doing a lot of amazing stuff on, on the GPU themselves. But when you start with vectors as the kind of source um, uh, information, um, what happens is that as, as some of those parcels start to get really small, it's very, very difficult to uh, accurately and truthfully render those to the screen. So this is what I'm starting to term vector rust. You start to see um, the kind of fidelity of, that, of, those, of those vectors starting to deteriorate as things get optimized for the web as well as just render that scales that don't. And this is where typically with, with kind of a vector-based rendering, you'd want to then shift to a different um, kind of representation going from like the block to the kind of tract or whatever else up that hierarchy. Um, and so, you know, we, we big believers in vectors. We think they're amazing, particularly for cartography, but for data viz, um, we're starting to see that, um, you know, there's cases where uh, raster data can be a lot more effective. And so the, the, the solution on, on the raster side is even if you're starting with vector data, um, you can render those at, at kind of a, a much more detailed uh, level where you can still see the parcels kind of accurately. And then we're doing we're using that slippy map kind of structure to just sum things very accurately. So um, similar to what I was saying about each um, tile being divided by four, here we're thinking about it in terms of pixels. Um, and so you know, if I imagine these four pixels here, when I go up one zoom level, that five, three, and two become 10. When I then go up one more zoom level, these numbers add to 29, et cetera. And so we're just truthfully representing values under each pixel. And the results are something where you, know, you don't get that same, uh, the same gaps. You know, this looks very crowded. There's a lot of detail here, um, but we're able to truthfully kind of um, render each pixel in terms of what's under it. Um, and so uh, we can do the same thing actually for record level data. Um, and so if you imagine that each of these points is a record that's um, at, a, at a point level and those records are falling on a pixel, as I zoom in, we're gonna be you know, uh, falling on different pixels. And so those just get aggregated and all we need is a solution that'll faithfully represent what is under um, each of these pixels. So at this high level, I have all of those dots, some brown, some blue. Um, and so, you know, that pixel when it's rendered needs to be um, brown or, or blue. And we'll talk a little bit about how we make that determination. Um, but first I wanted to show um, this example of this great data set um, that we have in Massachusetts, which is every single um, parcel in the whole of Massachusetts um, combined from all the different cities. And so it's about 2.5 million records. And I've, you know, um, it was kind of interesting to look at this vector-based representation on on the website, and this is the furthest you could zoom out. So this is a very detailed view of kind of um, Boston and Cambridge. Um, and each each parcel, so each record in this database is, you know, um, either a single family home or a, um, you know, a retail parcel or, or, or something. Um, and, you know, so there are a number of different, different records um, on that, but there's currently no solution we know of that could render all 2.5 million parcels faithfully um, at a state level, which is what the data actually represents. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of, of what that data looks like um, at the detail level. So that is 2.5 million um, unique records represented as pixels. Um, I'll get more into, if anyone's really interested in getting under the hood on how these data tiles work, I'm giving a presentation on that on, on Friday if you're interested in tuning in for that. Um, but basically what, what we do is we represent every single a parcel value as a pixel, we're just encoding the number, a pixel or color is actually just a number um, in RGB. Um, and so we just use that as a representation of the actual dollar value for each of those um, each of those parcels. And so that, you know, we can represent all that data in about 5.7 megabytes. Um, for the land use layer, it actually compresses a lot better because there's a lot fewer unique values through the magic of PNG. Um, and so what that gives us is a solution where we can actually be looking at um, the entire uh, database so is 2.5 million records. We're able to actually apply filters dynamically. So right now I'm just playing with the value. So these are the lower value parcels in Massachusetts. These are the higher value parcels in Massachusetts. You can see some pretty distinct trends there. Um, I can also start to apply a record level filtering to that. So I turned off single families, apartments, and condos. You get a very different impression, expanding that range, etc. So. Um, 
pretty pretty seamless. Um, and then I can zoom in pretty cl pretty close. You'll see that this you know starts to. This is where you might want to in a real tool start um, moving into a vector based representation to actually show those entire parcels. But you can see the trends um, and a fair amount of detail across the entire state. Um, so then another um, interesting area that, that we found is, um, and this, this is a really great tool, if, uh, if you're not familiar, I encourage you to check it out, uh, globalforestwatch.org, a great open source tool built with Mapbox, Earth Engine, Carto. Um, but one thing that I've been noticing with a lot of these tools is that um, when you get really dense, interesting data sets like this, um, and here blue is tree cover gain, pink is tree cover loss, um, you, it, it's very important that you're able to kind of read that that color mix accurately. And one thing I've noticed is that um, if you look over here, for example, this is a call out of this, um, just through the layering that's happening here, it looks like everything's fine in this area. There's very little tree cover loss, but when you actually zoom in, you'll see it's pretty much 50-50. And that's definitely not being faithfully represented here, which I think you know can certainly be a problem because it can lead to kind of um, misunderstanding and incorrect conclusions from the data. Um, something I've noticed that Esri are trying to do is like deal with that a little bit through some color blending, but it should be pretty clear that this could pose pose issues because you know obviously if you have blue and you have yellow, you get green. Um, they already have green, so except in like very niche circumstances, I think that's a, a solution that's not going to be very helpful. Um, and so the way that we solved this in in, in Zaru, um, and I'm going to just going to go quickly through this. Um, is if, if you kind of imagine that these are all values that are competing for this for the, these four pixels here. So if I had four red and two um, yellow on that pixel, could represent it like this as a little stack. If we imagine like a slightly larger area with kind of a different mix of, um, of different values that are competing for each pixel, we have a very simple solution to kind of resolve that. And that's just that we, we randomize. And so, uh, we're able to randomize, and then if we were to re-randomize, and literally it's just saying, I'm just going to pick up whatever value is in that slot. Obviously, there could be more than six values, but with the dice example, I just have six. And then it's literally just picking, including the, the gaps here. Um, so lower, um, lower density is kind of represented by, by fewer pixels in, in this stack here. Um, and so you can kind of see as we kind of move between those, like um, the micro scale changes radically, but the kind of wider scale is not really affected. Um, I'll just quickly give an example of, of that in the real tool. Um, and then also how we can kind of adjust the, um, the kind of density representation. Yes, so this is the dynamic dot density with that pixel mixing. Um, and so you can start to appreciate as we kind of play with some of these colors, how um, those kind of pixel mixes happen. Um, and, you know, so we can, adjust color here dynamically, kind of mouse over and actually see like what that mixes um, through some queries that are happening under the mask within that circle there. Um, and then the seed is kind of what I was showing there with the randomization. So you can see that even though we, we're changing the randomization, um, impressionistically, this map is not changing very much. And so that's very important. We don't want to see false patterns that aren't actually there. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, kind of show how this uh, tool also combines additional data sets. So this is all happening within Zaru. Um, and we're looking in this case, and um, uh, this is part of a research project where we're trying to understand the relationship between uh, park access and equity um, within the US. Um, my colleague Kai will be giving a presentation on that on, on Friday, if you're interested. Um, and so uh, this data is all coming out of um, Conveil's R5 tool. Um, so we're kind of understanding those walk isochrones as well as we can understand transit isochrones, for example, not a huge amount of transit in LA County, um, but we could switch to bike, for example. And you can see that people can easily bike to all these parks, but if you're just looking at a five minute bike. So this is looking at coverage and then we kind of combining that in terms of who has access and who doesn't have access for those different, uh, different needs. And then the last example I'll show um, is a multi-criteria analysis. And so, um, you know, just uh, it's kind of a great use case for pulling together multiple different considerations. So if you're familiar with multi-criteria analysis, you know, the idea in this case, we're looking at development desirability and where development should go. Um, and so the factors that we're kind of pulling into that are 
proximity to built-up areas, um, slopes, uh, agriculture, as well as a number of other factors. Um, and what we're looking to do with Zaru is rather than making um, those determinations up front before we necessarily know how that's going to influence the decision, we can kind of just delay those decisions on what are somewhat arbitrary metrics. Um, and so this is the last example I'll show, but basically what we're able to do, for example, this is the weighting for agriculture. If I'm able to tweak that, we can kind of see how that influences the, the color MPI. And, uh, in this example, blue is showing the areas that are desirable for development, red is showing the areas that are undesirable. As I make those agricultural areas less desirable, it's kind of changing the overall impression of that. Uh, we could also play, for example, with um, with the waiting for the roads and like the buffer distance from the roads. Um, and all of that is happening in real time. Uh, it's all being pre-calculated as kind of interim values. And we're able to tweak that out in real time uh, in this dashboard. Um, and then what that leads to is being able to essentially, you know, understand uh, the growth, the future growth. Um, just want to move through this quickly, but basically this is ex existing city limits. This is uh, next five years of growth and then the five years after that. Um, and then as I play with these different metrics, you can see how that kind of changes those growth boundaries. Uh, it ends up actually exceeding what our predictions are, but we just have this way of kind of calculating the breaks and kind of pulling that back. But that impression keeps kind of changing based on um, these different settings. That we're, so we're delaying all those decisions and then using them to re really kind of inform and kind of understand the dynamics of, of how growth might work in this area. Um, so just, yeah, just to sum up what Zaru is. So it's a proof of concept at this stage for like a different way of using GIS data. Um, it's really, a, you know, I think a demonstration of the power of WebGL for these kind of real time geospatial visualizations. Uh, we're big fans of, of raster data tiles. Um, so again, I'll be talking about that on, on, on Friday, hopefully trying to sell those. Um, and then, you know, a, a promising solution really for handling vast quantities of spatial data seamlessly. Um, dealing with and understanding uncertainty and kind of delayed decisions. Um, then viewing and browsing data from disparate sources. I mean, um, you can pull in data from, from anywhere just into this, this platform and kind of combine them on the fly on the, on the front end. And then, you know, I think it's a really interesting way to combine those data sources dynamically with some, some tools to really provide new insights. And we feel it's really ripe for open source collaboration. And then just to be clear what Zero is not. So it's not a tool you can use out the box currently. Uh, it's definitely not a replacement for GIS tools like QGIS or for cartographic tools like Mapbox. Um, unfortunately, it's not being super actively developed at the moment. We're kind of pushing it on select projects. Um, but we, you know, we wanted to uh, put it out there because we feel that there could be so many different use cases for some of these solutions. Um, and then, you know, we're not planning to um, take this down the VC route. We don't think it would be a very profitable tool. It's kind of um, very cheap, uh, very open. Um, and so, yeah, we wanted to talk about that, that, yeah. So, um, if you're interested in getting involved, check out the, um, the repo and the, and the demos, star the repo, if you're so inclined, uh, spread the word about this on social media and please reach out on, on, on GitHub. Um, and so, um, the, the, the link is right, right there, but if you just look up, um, Sasaki and, and, and Zaru, you should hopefully find it. Um, and then quick shout out to the Sasaki team, uh, Eric Youngberg, Kai Lau, and Ali Khan Mohammed, who really helped um, develop this and push it on projects. And then also just calling out some of the open source projects, Leaflet, Regal, Jimp, and Mapbox um, that we used to develop this. And that's that. Um, you can jump over to any questions. Yes, okay. Thank you, Ken. Um... Are there questions from the audience? Please type them in in, uh, in Vangelis. Um, there is one first question already mm -hmm. about um, are all the attributes shown in property map uh, stored in separate images as pixel values? That's an excellent question. Yes, that's exactly how, how that's working. So each each field gets an image and each, you know, so, um, and uh, yeah, that, that's something I'll be talking more about on, on Friday. So I apologize that I had to gloss over that aspect of it. Um, but yes, all, all of the data is encoded in, the, in those images. Um, there's actually two different um, types of uh, kind of image encoding. One, one is for record level lookups, which is the one I showed, and the other is just a more kind of straightforward uh, geospatial kind of representation.
Okay, more questions? I can imagine that there are some people curious about more technical aspects of it as well. Um, sort of for data preparation that goes into the Zaru mm -hmm. application, what what is uh, what has to be done? I mean, very often when you work with geospatial data, the preparation of the data is at least equally as time consuming than uh, running analysis. Uh, so the question is sort of how would one uh, or what has what has to be done to prepare data to get it in this? Yeah, so that that that's an ex excellent question. And on on the data side, um, you know, I, I ideally would start. I'd love to see more people producing data tiles that are ready for this kind of thing. I've noticed that um, that Esri are starting to use data tiles a little bit more in in their tools, it's, and it's an open source. Um, uh, uh, kind of encoding called LERC, L-E-R-C. Um, and they're starting to actually, um, for their own tools, kind of serve those up as data tiles. So I think that there is some movement happening. Obviously, that maps in um, those terrarium tiles, as they're called. Um, so those are all kind of pre-prepared. Um, but in terms of kind of taking data and, and prepping it, that, yeah, there's definitely a lot of work that still has to be done just on the, on the tooling front. We've done a little bit of work. We have like a, a QGIS um, plugin that we can use for kind of exporting data in this format as tiles um, with, the, with, with these encodings. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the idea behind Zaro is that you can take data tiles in any format and kind of remix them into meaningful visualizations. Um, but I, yeah, I think you know, the data tiles themselves, there's a huge potential there um, for that to be like a, a really kind of um, primary way of sharing a lot of geospatial information. I just think there's huge potential. Yes, another question. How much do mm -hmm. you need to know about WebGL, shaders, et cetera, to visualize data? Is abstracted away to something similar to Cato's CSS? That is such a good question. Not at this point. Um, so right now, and you know, Zara is ready at this proof of concept level. Um, there's very little of, of, of that kind of happening. You know, there are a few things that are kind of abstracted into, into settings and that kind of thing. Um, but it's still at the level where um, there's a fair amount of kind of shader code being, being written and being kind of customized in each, each, each use case. Um, so yeah, that's such a good question though. Like how, how you would take that and kind of abstract it to CSS would be a fairly um, large lift, but I absolutely think that, that would be the way you probably want to go. Yes, and then, then a similar question to what we discussed earlier is of what data format is used in Zaru? Yeah, so um, a, a couple of different formats. So um, the maps and tiles, that first one I showed, which is that global like, massive uh, data set that they produced, um, that is using, um, they call them the terrarium tiles. Um, well, that, that actually just refers to the elevation tiles that they have. Um, and so that's a that's a different format. It's it's also encoding um, numbers within within the PNG kind of space. Uh, we've kind of built on that a little bit because their format is really just suited to um, just uh, elevation data. Um, so we have a, a format called GeoPNGDB. Um, doesn't really roll to tongue, but uh, uh, and we'll be presenting more on that on on on, on Friday. Um, and that you know, and and then there's also um, I haven't. I only have like a very basic proof of concept using lurks, but um, that Esri format is also something you, that you can consume. So really, you know, the idea would be that you could represent the data in whatever format and then be able to kind of combine it within um, within Zaru. Okay, and then one last question maybe. I understand Zaru loads some raster tiles and accumulates them in layer, right? In one layer, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so each... Um, each tile is, it, it remains a, an individual slippy map tile. I know there's some other solutions which essentially take every, all those tiles, render them across to another image, which then gets fed to the GPU. And so you're rendering the whole screen at once. In this solution, um, each, each individual tile is rendered using Regal. OK. Thank you so much, Ken. And yeah. uh, then we switch over to the next speaker. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.